everybody. Uh, I think we have a couple people uh, joining us. In fact, I think the Russians were going to be joining us um, in Dallas tonight too. So um, did they did they hop on yet? I don't see them. Okay. Um, oh, somebody is. So, all right. Uh, so Hosea chapter 13. So we have just two chapters left. Hosea 13, and then uh, Hosea uh, chapter 14, and that'll that'll finish up our our study of of the, the prophet Hosea. And uh, so again, we have that double message again that uh, we've seen uh, over and over again throughout the, the book of Hosea. Uh, the Lord's uh, threat of that coming destruction along with uh, the, the promises that are there. And so as we look at the words that, that the Lord uses um, with, uh, with his people and with, with us, uh, we, we want to keep that in mind uh, of, of the reality of, of God's, uh, God's word. Uh, and as we, we just uh, studied in our confirmation class that just finished up 33 minutes ago, uh, we, uh, uh, we were looking tonight at, the, at the, the, the truth of God's word. And part of the truth of God's word means that God is always faithful to what he says. Yes. Um, God never just says something for, for emphasis or for, for just the sake of saying it, right? To, to, get a, uh, to get a rise out of people, right? Uh, uh, that's, not, that's not who God is. When God says something, he means it, and he always, he always means it. And so keep that in mind as we read through this section tonight. Uh, it is a little bit longer section, so it's about 10, 10 pages. So uh, let's begin tonight with this. Heavenly Father, we thank you for bringing us together around your word again this evening. Uh, remind us as we study uh, your prophet Hosea uh, that your words are always true uh, and that you mean everything that you say. Uh, Lord, as we, we listen to these words of, of warning uh, for uh, your people of old, uh, remind us that those same warnings hold true for us today. Uh, and Lord, as we hear the, the comfort of your promises and your love and your forgiveness in your son, uh, remind us that that same forgiveness is ours as well. Guide us in our study tonight for Jesus' sake. All right, so if you have the, the books, uh, it's page 107. Um, so in the, the section, I, I, uh, when I printed off the section, I tried to, to leave uh, the end of a page. So it should be the beginning of, of a page there uh, for Hosea chapter 13, uh, the Lord's anger against Israel. Uh, when Ephraim spoke, men trembled. He was exalted in Israel. But he became guilty of Baal worship and died. Now they sin more and more. They make idols for themselves from their silver, cleverly fashioned images, all of them the work of craftsmen. It is said of these people, they offer human sacrifice and kiss the calf idols. Therefore, they will be like the morning mist, like the early dew that disappears, like chaff swirling from the threshing floor, like smoke escaping through a window. Hosea mentions Ephraim as the outstanding tribe in the kingdom of Israel. Often, in fact, uh, the prophet has used the name Ephraim to stand for the whole nation in the north. Descendants of Joseph's second son, Ephraim, became prominent among the twelve tribes, especially <coughs> among these two individuals. Israel's great leader, Joshua, was an Ephraimite in Numbers 13. He received his family inheritance in the hill country of Ephraim, Joshua 19. The notorious Jeroboam I, who led the revolt of the northern ten tribes, also came from that tribe in 1 Kings chapter 11. Jeroboam, however, was not a leader in the tradition of faithful Joshua. By erecting the golden calves in Bethel and Dan, Jeroboam I set the course which mired the northern kingdom deeper and deeper in Baal worship and led to the spiritual death of his people. Israel abandoned the Lord, the source of all spiritual life. Like the prodigal son, as long as he remained far from home, in Luke 15, Israel was as good as dead. Dead in transgressions and sins. That's a reference to Ephesians chapter 2, right? As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins. <clears throat> the calves which Jeroboam erected are not the only images the Israelites are worshiping. The people fashioned their own household gods of silver. Every important archaeological dig in Israel has turned up samples of such fertility uh, images. They're usually female figures, often with exaggerated sexual features fashioned of precious metals or of humbler material like clay. These deities, Hosea says contemptuously, are all the work of craftsmen, verse 2, created
created by human hands, and so not to be compared with the Lord, man's maker, the creator of the world. Israel has adopted not only such Canaanite gods as Baal, Asherah, and Ashtoreth, but also the Canaanite worship ceremonies. They offer human sacrifice and kiss the calf idols. The biblical writers describe such worship by saying that they made their sons and daughters pass through the fire. The Lord's law expressly forbade such sacrifices. You must not worship the Lord your God in their way, because in worshiping their gods they do all kinds of detestable things that the Lord hates. They even burn their sons and daughters in the fire as sacrifices to their gods. That's back in Deuteronomy chapter 12. Kissing an image of Baal was another way of expressing devotion to the Canaanite god, 1 Kings chapter 19. <clears throat> Hosea describes the Lord's judgment upon such idol worship with four comparisons. Like mist or early dew burning off to the morning sun, like chaff driven from a windstorm by a windstorm from the threshing floor, or like smoke escaping from a house through a lattice hole in the wall, the Israelites will simply disappear from the stage of history. By the exile of Mesopotamia, the Lord will remove them from his presence, as he warned through all of his servants and prophets. In 2 Kings chapter 17. Before Israel entered the land, the Lord described as the Lord described his disgust with the sins of the Canaanites, especially their perversion of his gift of sex. It was as if the land of Canaan had become sick to its stomach because of the sins of its inhabitants. Even the land was defiled, so I punished it for its sin, and the land vomited out its inhabitants. Leviticus uh, chapter 18. The Lord warned the Israelites before they entered. If you defile the land, it will vomit you out as it vomited out the nations that were before you, Leviticus 18. In modern times, most people would be horrified to hear that human sacrifice is a common practice in their countries. Yet, in, the most of the, in most of the civilized nations of the world, uncounted thousands of mothers and fathers kill their children before they're born. They do so to maintain a high standard of living, to avoid the inconvenience of a family, or just to enjoy the pleasure of sexual intercourse without the responsibility of providing for a child. If what we love above all things is our God, then the gods of comfort, convenience, and pleasure are receiving an abundance of human sacrifices every day from those who worship them. In worshiping their gods, they do all kinds of detestable things the Lord hates, Deuteronomy 12. Can we Christians remain silent as such sins pollute our land? Or will we testify against them as God's law prophets do? And then deliverance in gratitude and judgment. <clears throat> but I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt. You shall acknowledge no God but me, no Savior except me. I cared for you in the desert, in the land of burning heat. When I fed them, they were satisfied. And when they were satisfied, they became proud. Then they forgot. So I will become upon them like a lion, like a leopard. I will lurk by the path. Like a bear robbed of her cubs, I will attack them and rip them apart. Like a lion, I will devour them. A wild animal will tear them apart. Here is Israel's whole history, summed up in just a few verses. Describing first the Lord's deliverance, then the people's ingratitude, and finally the Lord's judgment. When the Lord calls himself Israel's God from Egypt, in verse 4, uh, he recalls how he created this nation in Egypt and then delivered them from their Egyptian slavery. How can they acknowledge any other God except the Lord? Did he not care for them? The Hebrew says, I knew you in the desert. That is, he did not make his covenant with them in the burning wilderness. Uh, and that is, did he not make his covenant with them in the burning wilderness of Sinai? Then he kept his promise and shepherded his people in Canaan, a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey, as was referenced in Exodus 3. Satisfied with all the riches of the promised land, the Israelites are exalting themselves against their God and forgetting them, forgetting him, just as Moses warned in some of his last words. Je Jeshurun, that is the upright one, Israel, grew fat and kicked. Filled with food, he became heavy and sleek. He abandoned the God who made him and rejected the rock, his Savior. Deuteronomy chapter 32. To describe his judgment upon his people's forgetfulness, the Lord pictures himself with some of the fiercest similes in the whole Bible. Can we picture the Lord our God as being like a devouring lion, a lurking leopard, a she-bear robbed of her cubs and ready to rip someone open, a wild animal tearing his victim's body apart? Those are the 
comparisons he himself uses in verses 7 and 8 to describe his anger when his love is burned. Are we Christians ever tempted to despise the blood of Christ, to insult God's gracious spirit by stifling the voice of conscience, turning back to unbelief and sin? Then we need to hear all warnings like this. The New Testament repeats the same truth. It is a dreadful thing to fall into the hands of the living God, he says in Hebrews 10. His consuming anger is just as real as his boundless love. When we hear God's law, do we think he's just pretending to be angry before announcing his forgiveness? God is no play actor. If we cannot think our God in the, can't think of our God in the terms which Hosea uses, we underestimate his holy anger against sin. This was the anger that Christ bore when he took our place under the just wrath of his holy father. The rage of a devouring lion, a fierce leopard, a she-bear robber. <coughs> our Savior redeemed us from no make-believe curse when he became a curse for us. Reference to Galatians 3. Okay, and then um, that the Lord will destroy Israel. You are destroyed, O Israel, because you are against me, against your helper. Where is your king that he may save you? Where are your rulers in all your towns of whom you said, give me a king and princes? So in my anger, I gave you a king. In my wrath, I took him away. The guilt of Ephraim is stored up. His sins are kept on record. Pains as of a woman in childbirth come to him, but he is a child without wisdom. When, his, when the time arrives, he does not come to the opening of the womb. The Lord is revolved to carry out his judgment, since Israel has turned against him. Verse 9 illustrates the difficulty of some parts of the book of Hosea. Translated word for word, it says, He has destroyed you, Israel, for in or against me, in or against your helper. Many translators have changed the person of the verb at the beginning, reading, I have destroyed, or you have destroyed, to fit the thought of the, part of, the, of the last part of the verse. All English translations must add some supplementary words. Faced with difficulties in this verse, we try to translate in keeping with the verses before and after it. The King James Version has, O Israel, thou hast destroyed thyself, but in me is thine help, in agreement with such passages as Isaiah 3 and Jeremiah 2. Where is your king? Where are your rulers, the Lord asks in verse 10. <clears throat> Perhaps by this time, Shalmaneser V has already seized and imprisoned Hoshea, the last king of Israel, and the capture of Samaria is near. God is reminding the Israelites that the request they brought to Samuel over three centuries ago, appoint a king to lead us such as all the other nations have, already showed a lack of faith in him and aroused his anger. The Lord told Samuel, it is not you they have rejected as their king, but me. 1 Samuel chapter 8. Now in his anger against the Israelites' rebellious idolatry, the Lord has taken away their king and banished him to Assyria. God will no longer forgive, forgive the guilt of his backsliding people. Their iniquity is bound to them, like the guilt of the impenitent sinners mentioned by Jesus in Matthew 16 and, and 18. Their sin is kept on record, in verse 12, to accuse them in the judgment. The Lord would like to call Israel his dear son again. But this people is like a child misplaced in the womb, an unwise child that does not know how to be born when the mother's time comes and the birth pangs begin. By despising his, its opportunity to repent, Israel refuses to be reborn as God's child. Very early in the book of Hosea, chapter 1 and 2, we observe the prophet's sudden alternations of threat and promise, law and gospel, the most striking example of all occurs in chapter 13, verse 14, a promise of the resurrection followed immediately by a further threat of judgment for Samaria and the northern capital. Victory over death. I will ransom them from the power of the grave. I will redeem them from death. Where, O death, are your plagues? Where, O grave, is your destruction? The Lord's will is to save his people, not to destroy them. Every word of judgment for Israel is put aside for a moment as the Lord described the great victory over an enemy which has dominated all mankind ever since the fall of man. Death is the enemy which entered the world and oppresses all mankind as a result of sin. Using Hebrew parallelism, the Lord designates death with two words. The first, Hebrew Sheol, usually translated the grave, a term reaching beyond temporal death to describe God's judgment upon sin. And the second, the simple word death, which ever
ever since the fall, man has shared with the animals, as God said, thus you are, and to thus you will return. Genesis 3. The Lord will pay whatever price is necessary to ransom his people from death for himself. He will act like the Israelite kinsman redeemer who buys back family property to keep it from passing into possession uh, of into the possession of another. Uh, this uh, reference back to Ruth. Uh, remember Ruth and Boaz, that's what uh, Boaz ended up being, the, the kinsman redeemer who um, married and, and bought back the, the price uh, to keep, keep the, uh, the inheritance in the family. Even though Israel as a nation will die, yet the Lord has chosen, has his chosen remnants of believers in Israel. And for them, death in an Assyrian siege or exile in Mesopotamia will not mean the end of life with God. He will buy them for himself, even from the power of death and the grave. When Paul quotes this passage in 1 Corinthians 15, he also cites Isaiah 25. He will swallow up death forever. The ransom price is paid in the death of God's son, Jesus. He guarantees the victory over death by his bodily resurrection from the grave. The Lord's prophecy in Hosea 13, verse 14, will be fulfilled and the final victory celebration will begin when the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. For the perishable must clothe itself with the imperishable, and the mortal with immortality. Uh, 1 Corinthians 15. Then the plagues and destruction which death imposes on our bodies in the grave will be undone in a moment. Both believing Old Testament Israel and the New Testament Christian church enjoy the victory over death already now by faith. Therefore, an Old Testament believer could confidently say, God will redeem my soul, that is my life, from the grave. He will surely take me to himself. Psalm 49. And even in the face of our own and our, and our believing dear one's death, we Christians thank God because he gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. And the people of Samaria must bear their guilt. I will have no compassion even though he thrives among his brothers. An east wind from the Lord will come, blowing in from the desert. His spring will fall and his well dry up. His storehouse will be plundered of all its treasures. The people of Samaria must bear their guilt because they've rebelled against their God. They will fall by the sword. Their little ones will be dashed to the ground, their pregnant women ripped open. The word translated compassion in the last line of verse 14 could, be, could mean repentance in the sense of a change of mind as in Psalm 110. In that case, this line concludes the prophecy of the resurrection. The Lord will not change his mind about his promise. If the end of verse 14 includes the final verses of chapter 13, the Lord is saying that he will not change his mind about Israel's doom. The trial is over. The sentence is spoken. There can be no appeal to the mercy of the court. The hot wind blowing in from the eastern desert drying up every well, every spring and well, pictures the Assyrian armies wreaking destruction as they burn the Israelite cities and lay siege to Samaria. Israel has paid tribute to Assyria for decades, and now the Assyrian armies will seize whatever precious things remain. Hosea, the other prophets, and even the historical writers of the Bible are not primarily interested in giving us a blow-by-blow -blow description of the war in the style of the daily newspaper. They concentrate instead on the power and purpose behind Israel's defeat. The withering blast from the east representing the Assyrians is called the wind of the Lord. The underlying reason for the end of the northern kingdom is not unpreparedness in Israel's armed forces or a lack of wisdom in the nation's foreign office, but rebellion against the Lord. The people of Samaria must bear their guilt because they rebelled against Hosea has documented the spiritual and moral failure of the Israelites as a nation earlier in his book. The last verse, <clears throat> chapter 13, describes in three stark sentences the end of the history of the northern kingdom. When the Assyrians take Samaria in 722 BC, many inhabitants of the city will die by the sword. Enemy soldiers will dash out the brains of little children on the stones. They will even rip open pregnant mothers to destroy their babies in the womb. Through such enemy atrocities, the Lord will cut off the nation's future. The history of the northern kingdom began when Jeroboam I 
led the northern kingdoms, the northern tribes away from the Lord's chosen king of the house of David in Jerusalem. It ended when the Assyrians captured Samaria in 722 and exiled Israel to Mesopotamia. The Israelites persisted in all the sins of Jeroboam and did not turn away from them until the Lord removed them from his presence, as he had warned through all of his servants, the prophets. That's 2 Kings 17. The Lord carried out his judgments he described to Moses and at, at Mount Sinai. If you reject my decrees and abhor my laws and fail to carry out all my commands and so violate my covenant, your land will be laid waste and your cities will lie in ruins. You will perish among the nations. The land of your enemies will devour you. Those of you who are left will waste away in the lands of their enemies because of their sins. Also, because of their father's sins, they will waste away. And that's Leviticus 26. All right. You're hired. Yeah. What's that? I said you're hired. Hired. <laughs> I'm hired? Yeah, for a mission to the middle of curve. <coughs> and by the way, we did find out we recorded something for a music presentation about a while back. Years and years. Uh, uh, there was a devotion I, I did for Elaine Stint one time. Yep. Is that it? Uh, John chapter 10? In the music. Yeah. yeah. yeah we're going to actually God's my shepherd. we yeah. put that up on the, on the website. All right. It's a work in progress, right? <laughs> we're about uh, All right. So Hosea chapter 13. Uh, destined to destruction, but delivered from death. And, uh, and so uh, verse 11 so in my anger, I gave you a king, uh, and, and uh, the commentator brings that brings that out. Uh, this this goes back to the time of Samuel. Uh, if you remember during the time of Samuel, and uh, Samuel was the last of the judges. Uh, if you think of the book of the book of Judges, um, and Samuel actually served as as leader. He served as judge. Uh, he also served as priest. So he kind of had a, a multi-faceted role that, that, he, that he faced. Uh, but as Samuel was growing older, the people come to him and say, we want to have a king. Everybody around us has a king. We want to be like all the other nations. We want to have a king too. And this, this angers, angers the Lord. We want, we want to be like the other nations. And, and that's when God gave them uh, King Saul. Uh, he gave them a king like all the other nations. Um, now, and, and we've talked about this a little bit before, the Lord had actually already in Deuteronomy set up the foundation for Israel having a king in the future. Uh, but the Lord also stipulated uh, that it was going to be his king, and he was going to set up the, the guidelines for how that king was to operate. Uh, so when the people ask for a king like all the other nations, right, it's, it's that... Um, it's that old adage, be careful what you ask for, because you might just get it. And there are countless, countless stories among authors throughout history, right, of people who have wanted something and they're willing to bargain for it, or they don't know what they're asking for, and they ask for it, and they realize at the, at the end that this wasn't a good thing that they asked for, and they try to take it back, but it's too late, they've already asked for it, right, and, um, it, that is the that is the story of history, right? We um, we don't know we don't know what's best for us. Uh, we're like we're often like little children. A little child who sees something in the store window and says, "I have to have that." They don't even know what it is, but they have to have it. Uh, and and our lives are, are like that so often too. Uh, we see someone with something that, that we think is going to be is going to be good, and so we we want it, and we end up getting it, and and. We never, we never use it because it's it's not you know it's not useful to us. So we you know, we we buy it. It sits it sits on our shelf or sits in our garage or sits you know, in a spare room and it gathers it gathers dust. Um, and that's true with things. It's also true with the things that we think are good for us in our lives. Uh, you know, and, and how often uh, when we have when we have those, those trials in our lives uh, that we we simply want it to go away. Uh, we want it to be removed. And, and uh, oftentimes the removal of that may not be the best thing for us. Uh, and <clears throat> it's, it's, through, it's through those, those times that, that we become stronger. 
And so uh, the reference there is, is given, uh, 1 Samuel chapter 8, uh, during the time of Samuel. Uh, and then the Lord does anoint uh, Saul to be the king, and Saul actually starts out to be a, a pretty good king. Uh, he serves Israel faithfully for the first, first few years, uh, and then things start to fall apart pretty quickly. And uh, the, first, the first king of Israel uh, ends in, in disgrace along with the, with the nation. Uh, horrible, a horrible ending to a, to a horrible, horrible reign. <clears throat> and then the Lord anoints and calls the king that he wants. And, uh, and that, then uh, God, God, God leads them through that, through that king. Uh, but, uh, but notice what he says. He says, you're, you're asking, and, and you, you were already showing your unfaithfulness to me when you, when you asked for a king. And so if your, your, your uh, reign of kings started in disarray, and it's going to finish. These are these are bookends, right? They they start start with a with a dismal beginning, and it, it ends just as dismal. Uh, you know, if you, if you think of, of the end of, of King Saul's reign, it's a horrible defeat uh, at at the hands of the Philistines, and and Saul uh, Saul is wounded. He commits suicide. Uh, the nation the nation is defeated, and you're sitting there with with the Philistines having conquered. And it ends with the Assyrians coming in and doing doing the same same thing. So, um, so in in my anger, I gave gave you a king. You 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 were asking for this, and so uh, and as they as they continue to reject the Lord, uh, and as he he describes uh, in you know very graphic terms throughout the whole chapter, right? Uh, uh, it's you know these kinds of things that, that almost make us make us cringe. Human sacrifice, uh, people being mutilated dashed to pieces and uh, you know just the, the horrific mutilations and all, all these these things that are that are talked about um, it's uh, it's it's all a result of of their of their unfaithfulness. that that bright spot right with the ransom and the redeeming um, and he uses that that image that the Israelites would have been familiar with with the king kinsman redeemer so kinsman right refers to uh, this is a distant relative all right so when um, so the, in that one reference that we have with a very clear example of that in, in Ruth, uh, Ruth chapter 3 and 4, uh, we don't have time to, to go into that. I, I would encourage you just to read those, read those chapters to kind of see what all took place. Uh, but, but very simply, uh, it was a relative who could still bear the name uh, of the family, uh, would come in and uh, redeem, rescue, uh, buy back what was going to be lost to, in, the, in the family name. Because remember, when, when uh, the Israelites uh, received the promised land at the end of the book of Joshua, after they conquered the, the main strongholds of the Canaanites, uh, they divided the land among the tribes. So each tribe got a section of land, and then the tribe got together, and they cast lots for each, uh, each clan and each family, and so everybody had their own designated inheritance, their, their portion of land. Uh, and that land was to stay in the family. Uh, this was their inheritance from the Lord. And so God wanted them to keep it. And that meant being passed on from generation to generation, which then gets into the kinsman redeemer, the law of the leveret. Um, you know, with, uh, you know if, someone, um, if someone died without, uh, without a, a male, male heir, uh, then the next closest relative would marry the widow, uh, and, uh, and then that, that first child would bear the name of, of the man who had died, so, so that name would then would be carried on and the, and the land would stay, would stay in the family. Um, Boaz served, served in that capacity uh, with, with Ruth and, and uh, kept, kept the, the inheritance uh, there. Um, that also comes up, if you recall, um, in the northern kingdom. And they were very familiar with this, even in the northern kingdom. This comes up with, with Naboth's vineyard. If you remember during the time of the, the reign of King Ahab, uh, when, when Ahab and Jezebel and, and Ahab's uh, palace was next to Naboth's vineyard, and he, he saw this beautiful vineyard, and he said, oh, this is a great piece of land. I want to, I want to buy it. So he goes and, and finds out Naboth is the owner. He tries to buy it from Naboth, and Naboth says, I can't sell it to you. Even if I wanted to sell it to you, I can't. This is this is my family inheritance from the Lord. I, I can't sell you this. I, and then they, they plot uh, they plot against him uh, for blasphemy, have him executed, and then take over the, the property. Right? Um, so a, a, a gross uh, you know 
mishandling of, of that whole that whole system. Uh, but but God uses it here in a very very beautiful way, right? In that one uh, short verse that is the one bright spot in this in this chapter uh, to give us give us this uh, this act of, of redeeming that that uh, that we have uh, in being brought back from our from our sins. All right. Into the verses, uh, going back to verse three, there's four successive uh, similes that he gives: uh, do, mist, chaff, and uh, what's smoke? Smoke, what? smoke right? Um, so, what do all of those have in common? Except they disappear. Yeah. They all disappear, uh, right? If, uh, depending on how early you you you, make, you get up, uh, you know, you walk out in the morning, and the grass is all wet. Right within a, within an hour or so after the sun comes up, it's all dried off and it's gone. Uh, you get up early. There's a there's a foggy mist, uh, you know, hanging around, and it doesn't take too long and that's burned off. Uh, on a windy day, you know, with, with if you see the uh, those those few few minutes that those wheat fields are, are being harvested uh, around uh, mid June uh, here, you know, and, and you see. You see that the chaff blowing as the as the harvesters are coming coming through. If it's a windy day, it doesn't take long and it's gone, right? Um, and you know what happens to smoke, right? As it as it rises up, uh, and uh, whether it's uh, you know you're having a a, a fire pit fire or uh, you're smoking your favorite meat or whatever, right? The smoke goes up and then it it dissipates and it's gone. Um, what does this suggest about the fate of Israel? After the exile, they're going to disappear, be removed from God's presence. Yeah, it's, uh, you're you're going to cease to exist, just as these other things cease to exist. And remember, that is what took place with the Northern Kingdom. Uh, it never it never came back. Uh, there were there were a few people who could still trace their ancestry back. Right, we see that in the New Testament. Uh, there's a few uh, who can trace their ancestry back to some of those tribes, uh, but that nation never never came back. Uh, it, it became the land of, of Samaria, right? The Samaritans who were hated by the Israelites because they were this mixed mixed breed of people. They, they had some Jewish blood, uh, but they had all these other, other nations. And by the way, that is what that is what the Assyrians, that was one of the, the Assyrians' uh, tactics in, in battle and the aftermath of battle. Uh, to prevent any national uprisings, they would take all the nations that they had conquered and they'd just throw everybody together. Right? So you don't have one camp for the for the for the Israelites and another camp for uh, the people of Syria and another camp for they just throw everybody together, mix them all up, and what happens? There's no there's no organized resistance because they're all these different different people and they all just kind of mix mix together. Um, that was one of their strategic uh, ways of, of preventing anybody from from opposing them after they had, had conquered. You can't rise up if you're all all from from different different nations. Um, and that's and that's what took place. And even the people who, who remained, they were just infiltrated with with that. And we see that in some of the the, the later written books, Ezra, Nehemiah, right? When we, we hear about the the exiles from the southern kingdom, right? Because God's promise of sending the Savior was still there. So with the Babylonians, after seventy years, they come back. And as they return, remember they're building, rebuilding Jerusalem. They're they're rebuilding the walls. They're also rebuilding the temple. But if you recall from from the content of those those books, what happened is they started rebuilding. Do you remember what happened? They actually faced opposition. And who was opposing them? The Samaritans, right? The, the the people who were were living in the in the land. These these are the these are the uh, the mutts, right? That that are all all conglomerated together. Uh, they don't want the temple to be rebuilt, right? And so there's that animosity already then, um, to the point where they're they're rebuilding the walls, they're rebuild, rebuilding the temple, and the workers uh, have their trowel in one hand, working with the stone, and they got a sword in the other hand. Because uh, it, the, the threat is is that is that real uh, in trying to trying to rebuild, um, and that so that maybe helps you to understand that a little bit of the animosity we see in the New Testament with the Samaritans, right? Uh, and when Jesus tells the parable of the good 
Samaritan, right? You could you could almost then just feel everybody, it, all the all the Jewish people in that in that crowd that day, just cringing that Jesus would be lifting up uh, a Samaritan as the good guy, and all the the the, the prime Jewish people, the, the priests and the Levites, right? And, and they're the bad guys. That's ex do, and that's why, if you remember, the, the man who asked the question when Jesus says, well, which one was, was a neighbor? He can't even say Samaritan, right? He's like, uh, well, right? Uh, he can't even, he can't even, he can't even bear to stomach the, saying the word Samaritan. Yes. Uh, you know, and, and so that, that animosity was, was very, very real. Uh, but, but yes, they, they, they cease to exist as a nation. Um, no longer, like, like the chaff going away in the, in the wind. Okay, number two. Um, how can the fierce descriptions of God found in verses 7 and 8, right? So uh, if we look at seven verses 7 and 8 again. Um, so I will come upon them like a lion, like a leopard. I will lurk by the path like a bear, rob them or cubs. I will attack them and rip them open. Like a lion, I will devour them. A wild animal will tear them apart. Wow. Right, so how can we reconcile what God describes there with the Bible's assertion that God is a loving, loving Father? Loving, right? He's a God of grace. He's a through God of his love. Son. Hmm? Through his Son. Okay? It, it's resolved through Jesus, isn't it? Right? Um, those, those two concepts, those two qualities of our God, uh, the, 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 the resolve... Is, is found in, in Jesus who, who did everything in our, in our place. Uh, but we have to be careful, right, that we don't misunderstand uh, and say, well, you know, God isn't, God is just, just using some really harsh language here. He just wants to wake them up. Um, you know, and he, he doesn't really mean it, mean it that he, this is what he would do. Right? Um, that, that God isn't, no, he just, he just wants to get our attention. He, you know, it's like the it's like he's just crying wolf, yeah. right? Uh, the good boy who cries, cries, oh, there's a lot of danger there. You better better change or else. Uh, but he's not really going to do it. Uh, and uh, we have to be careful that, that we don't, uh, uh, you know, and, and I think as, as Christians, and I think the longer that we are Christians, the more that is a danger for us. Uh, because we, we are so inundated with God's love, grace, and mercy in Jesus that we can start to belittle sin and that it's not that big of a deal anymore uh, because, because Jesus is our Savior. Jesus paid for our sins. So, uh, yeah, I sinned, but yeah, it's, Jesus paid for it. So it's, it's not that big of a deal. Um, and God's, God's message to us today is, is do not ever cheapen God's grace to us. Uh, don't ever make God's grace as something that's easy or something that's just so readily available that it just you know isn't isn't a, 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 you know this this precious precious thing that it is. Um, and uh, you know and that this is that that formidable power uh, you know and you know that because we we see what's what was. Uh, you know how, how powerful Israel was, and how much of a nothing they they had become. Uh, you know, and and you know that kind of goes back a little bit to question uh, question one again too. But um, if if you think of think of what uh, what Israel was, the nation of Israel in the in the United Kingdom under under David and Solomon, um, they were a world renowned power. Right, the, uh, David secured the borders, uh, defeated all of his enemies. Solomon, right? He had he had visitors from all over the world coming to see him, and and the, the wisdom that, that he had, and the, the majesty of that kingdom. Uh, by this time, right? There's that there's that that chap again, uh, but. <coughs> But with, when we see what what God uh, what God does, uh, we, we have to make sure that we understand that God is not just pretending to hate sin so we'll change. That God would actually do what He say. That God would actually send somebody to help. God's a God of love, right? And and how how much of the world not only believes but proclaims.
proclaims that about God. He's also a God of his word. He's right. always. Didn't change. And, and then to understand that, that the harshness of what God is saying here is not just his judgment, but it is actually his love. Right? That uh, it's, it's one of those things where God, God says, I want you to know what the penalty is. I want you to be aware of how serious this is so that you do change. Right? I'm not just blowing smoke. Uh, this is real. But I am telling it to you because I love you. Uh, and, and, you know, as uh, those of you who are parents, right, you, 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 you know that, right? Uh, you, you, don't, you don't just, you, you understand, right, that you can't just make idle threats, right? When your kids, when your kids were growing up, right, if, if they understood that you didn't really mean the threats that you were making, what'd they do? <laughs> yeah, yeah that, that's, that's mom just yelling again. Yeah. She's mad. She won't actually do what she's saying, right? Uh, if, if they, but, but if they understand that when you say that, it is actually going to happen. Uh, yeah, they tend to listen. Uh, that tends to, to they, they, unless unless they're really really stubborn, right? Which which does happen also. Uh, but if if they if they think in their mind or if they figured out and say, well, yeah, said it before, I didn't actually mean it. So I know he said. Boldness to sin gets okay, grows exponentially, um, and so God God wants and and the reality of what what took place, what God says here in this chapter, all of those things actually took place. So, I am amazed that they rebelled, even knowing what was going to happen. It, it's mind blowing. Yeah. Well, and and that. Uh, but if, but if you think of the, of the prophets, um, and not just the true prophets, remember there were also false prophets out there. And, that, um, and we, we uh, will see that uh, with, um, with Amos, especially. And we just had a lesson from Amos um, a month or two ago. Uh, remember uh, when, when the, the prophet of, of, I believe it was Jeroboam, uh, you know, and, the, and the priest of Jeroboam, uh, he hears the words of Amos, and he says, you get out of here. What do you do? You, you go back to Judah where you came from. Don't you dare talk to us like that. Don't you dare talk about God's destruction. This is, I'm, I'm, I'm the king's prophet. I'm, you know, and they, uh, and so the, the, the threats, uh, at the same time they're hearing the threats from the true prophets, they're also hearing those other messages from the false prophets. Um, and if you have one person telling you destruction, 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 and the other person is saying, ah, don't worry, that's not going to really happen. Which one are you going to, you know, which one are you more likely to believe, right? Uh, I don't want the bad things to happen. So if somebody says they're not going to happen, I'll, I'll, I'll cling to that. Um, and um, I was just, just talking about that um, in one of our, uh, it was at yes, maybe the, yesterday morning in our study, uh, you know, with, uh, you know, as we, we see what's happening um, in, on the other side of the world right now and, and how quickly things are falling apart. Uh, but all we have to do is go back 20 years and see how quickly um, things fell and how quickly the Afghan people were, were latching onto us and saying, oh, this is so great. Well, what's happening now that the Taliban are coming? Right? They're latching onto them and saying, okay, we'll, 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 go, with, we'll, we'll go with you. Uh, why would they do that? Why would they be nice to us when we're there and now go with, go with the other side when we're not there. Self-preservation. I want to be on the winning side, yeah. right? Whoever, whoever, whoever's holding the gun, that's my friend. Yeah. Exactly. Um, and that is nothing new. That is nothing new, right? Uh, that's human nature. That's sinful human nature. And it's always been that way. Just think uh, of today. I mean, they take it away the punishment of crime, and what do they do it? We're committing crime yeah. like crazy. Right. I mean, just exactly. walk in, spill it in your Yeah. Uh, I mean, we we do. Yeah, go ahead. Have a thing. Uh, we do the same thing, right? If I if I'm intent on 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 uh, doing something wrong, and and you know, there's no police officer out, out there to, to catch me speeding, 
And if I want to go 10 miles an hour over the speed limit, I'll go 10 miles an hour over the speed limit. <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah try, try getting out of here oh, yeah. between 5 and 6 o'clock on any, any given night. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, if the speed limit is 50, but there's very few of anybody that's going 50, 50 miles an hour. Well, if you go 50 miles an hour, they get mad at you. Oh, yeah. They so, yeah. Yeah. Yes. Uh, but, but you see, this, this, is, this is what's happening. And Paul, I, I agree, right? How, how, the words are right here. How could they, how could they not? Um, somebody asked that in the confirmation class today, too. It was like, you know, with, with Jesus, Jesus fulfilling all those promises, how could they not believe in Jesus when he was there? How could they continue worshiping Baal yeah. and ascribing to yeah. him the fertility? I just, it's just hard to believe. Well, it's just like today. And, and we are we are just as fickle, right? We we have to we have to understand that that we we are uh, our sin. My sinful nature is just as fickle. Uh, I can sit in church and I can praise God all day long, and then I go out and I face temptation. And what happens? I cave. Mm -hmm. We weaken. I'm yeah, uh, because I'm I'm surrounded by 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 this, and and all of a sudden I'm I'm doing the opposite that I did when I was in church. Or I don't even wait that long, right? Uh, you know, think of what think of how, how the New Testament book of James uh, describes it, right? Uh, with the same mouth, we we praise God and we curse people, right? So I can I can be in church praising God, and by the time I get out in the parking lot, I'm talking bad about someone. Minutes apart, right? It happens. <laughs> but but you see it's 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 that reality and and the the descriptions right uh, the only reconciliation there is is in is in Jesus right uh, but if we if we but I can't I can't appreciate the lengths of love my Savior went to save me. Until I understand and realize the severity of what God is saying here and the reality of, of what, yeah. what he is describing. Um, that that when, when Jesus took on the curse of sin, lions, leopards, bear robbed her cubs, ripping them apart, tearing them apart, devouring them. Uh, that's the curse that Jesus... Jesus took on in our place. Uh, that is how much God hates sin. Uh, and, if, and if we ever forget that or try to lessen God's anger, we actually cheapen Jesus. And we never want to cheapen Jesus. Uh, number three, uh, the, the metaphor in verse 13, did you catch what, what he was saying? Uh, he, he describes it, he says, pain Pains as of a woman in childbirth come to him, but he's a child without wisdom. And when the time comes, he doesn't come to the opening of the womb. Israel, Israel's refusal to be reborn. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, and, and uh, the commentator brings that out brings that out well, right? It's, yeah. it's this: uh, God has done everything to make Israel His child, but as, as Jesus prays and weeps over Jerusalem, right? Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who stone the prophets and, and, and kill those who are sent to you. How I long to gather you together as a, as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings. But you were not willing. You, were not willing. Mm -hmm. you refused. I wanted, I wanted to bring you as my, as my child, uh, but you wanted to stay in the world, right? You, you, don't want, you don't want to come. Uh, and, and that's the picture, that's the, the image, imagery that, uh, that, God, that God gives here. Uh, they, uh, they are, are just, they're stubborn, they lack, uh, they lack that sense. And, and again, without the Spirit, right, the man without the Spirit does not think except the things that come from the Spirit of God. Uh, and it's foolishness to them because, it, because those things are only spiritually understood. Uh, which, is, which helps to explain uh, the progression of what we've been seeing in the Gospel lessons 
for the last several weeks, right? As, as the people are getting angrier and angrier at Jesus in John chapter 6. Uh, and Jesus, Jesus keeps getting deeper into that picture, and the deeper he gets into the picture, the angrier the people, people get. They, they begin by grumbling, and then they argue with Jesus. And then they say, how, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? You know, uh, all these things. And what we're going to see this Sunday uh, is the people finally just turn around and leave, right? It says, uh, after that time, Jesus, many of Jesus' disciples left and no longer followed him. Uh, they, they just, they, they, as we talked about on Sunday, they couldn't stomach Jesus, uh, which is uh, what he had to offer them. They just, they just, no, this, uh, he was offering something that they just didn't think. This I've been doing. I've, I've done all this. Gene. What do I? What I still need to do? Right. Um, and it just. And he was. He was simply an example of what. What we saw in the in the crowd uh, in John chapter six as well. Uh, number four, we see Hosea's characteristic shift between judgment and comfort. Law and gospel once more in uh, in verse fourteen with that that little bright spot there in verse fourteen. How would this comfort the faithful in Israel who heard Hosea's prophecies, right? Judgment, 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 promise. Judgment, judgment, judgment. Death doesn't mean the end of life of God. Even if, right, right they are ripped apart by the Assyrians and their, their babies are dashed to pieces and the pregnant women are ripped open, um, even as all those bad things happen, uh, because, again, the Assyrians aren't going to ask and say, are you a true believer in God, or are you worshiping Baal? Mm -hmm. Okay, you worship Baal? All right, we're going to chop you up. Well, you worship God, we're going to leave you alone. Mm -hmm. They didn't differentiate. Right? Um, and, and remember that Elijah had that promise from the Lord as well. Right? You still, I still have my faith in I still have my faith in and, and as the faithful believers are reading the prophecy of Hosea and listening to those words, uh, they're hearing that. They're hearing that promise, um, and God has the power even over death itself, right? And, and think of how that's brought up in that beautiful resurrection chapter. Where O oh, death is your victory? Where O oh, death is your sting? The sting of death is sin. The power of sin is the law. Thanks be to God. He gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, so even even with even with death itself, right? God God has that power. Even over, even over the, the fiercest of enemies of sinful, sinful mankind, uh, <clears throat> and so even if they're caught up in the in the chaos of what was coming, uh, they can take comfort in the fact that that even death and the grave does not separate them from their God, uh, and uh, and that's our comfort too. Right? That's why uh, you know as uh, you know, as we uh, close tonight with, with uh, prayer for our, for our friends who have joined us in the past, uh, you know, what, whatever happens with that with that cancer, uh, right? And and, and you've, you've heard it oftentimes uh, when somebody has has cancer and the cancer progresses and that person ends up dying as a result of, of their cancer. Uh, that person lost their path. Well, they're a believer in Jesus. Cancer never wins. Cancer always gets beat. It might take their life, but it doesn't win. Yes, it's going to take your spiritual life. Exactly. Right. Exactly. Uh, and and uh, death uh, for us as believers is never a loss. Right? It's always a win. Now it's it, it hurts for those those loved ones who are still here who do and love that person. Uh, but there's there's no loss. There's no loss. Well, did Jesus even weep when he bought yeah. Lazarus? Right. And 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 so yeah, the weeping, uh, all of those things, right? The mourning for for loved ones, absolutely. Uh, but losing them, I don't lose them. I know exactly where they are. They're not lost. <laughs> They're with Jesus. There's no doubt about that. And, and as we as we see that, uh, we can take comfort in, in the fact that, that, that death does not destroy them. And even the horrific ugliness of, of what God describes here, or what's going on in, in, in any part of the world at any, any given, 
given time, um, or even natural disasters such as the, the floods up in up in Tennessee. Right? Um, when, uh, the last I saw was 20, 22 people, I think, who died. Um, and uh, and so I think there's some that are still missing. Still missing. Uh, but uh, you know, for any any believers who perished in that flood, they weren't lost. They were Jesus. There's no loss there. Um, and if we can if we can keep that focus in the midst of that, we're still going to grieve for our loved ones. We're still going to mourn. We're still going to weep. Uh, we're still going to be sad. They've gained heaven. Yes. And we have the promise from our Lord. 1 Thessalonians 4 says it specifically. We have the promise that we will see them again. Thank you for that. Yeah. Right? Um, and, you know, and so no matter how long you've been married, right, no matter, you know, all that time that you, that you spent, right, you're going to see your, your, your beloved wife again. Yes. Yes. Right? Uh, you're going to be reunited with her. Yes. Uh, God says that. You haven't lost her. Uh, we're just without that person in this in this world for this time. I thank God often for the time I have her with yeah, her. Absolutely. Yeah, we thank God for that. And and then we, we thank God that, that we're we're still uh, able to give him honor and praise each day as we continue to live out our time here on this on this earth until the Lord takes us to, to, to that victory uh, that he has won for us as well in Jesus. Um, and so uh, the going back uh, you know, the, the death that he speaks of in verse 1, uh, though, so question number 5, uh, physical death or spiritual death? Spiritual. Spiritual death, right? He's talking about spiritual death there. Uh, and, right, so uh, he became guilty of veil worship and died. Uh, right, so uh, these, these spiritually dead people were still very active Right? Because uh, notice what he says. He says in verse 1, they died. But in verse 2, he says, now they sin more and more. They make idols for themselves. Right? They're, they're still very active in all kinds of worship. They're very religious people. But they're dead. Uh, and, uh, and so what is true life? True life only comes through faith in Jesus. Exactly. Um, that is the only way. That goes back to uh, the reference that was made in the commentary from Ephesians chapter 2. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins. Um, but while, And then a few verses later, he says, while we were still dead in our sins, God made us alive in Christ Jesus. It is by grace you have been saved. Uh, and so he, he gives us that, that true life in, in Jesus. <clears throat> now the reference was made uh, also... Uh, in um, in the middle, uh, let's see where is that section? Uh, in uh, the first first few few verses, there is that is talking about uh, you know they offer human sacrifice, they kiss kiss the calf idols, and uh, <clears throat> then you know the the sacrifice of the of the children, and, and uh, there was a lot there were a lot of things that God did put up. When, when it came to that, God says, okay, that's what you're going to do. Uh, when I specifically so you know, you're taking your, my gifts to you uh, in, your, in your children, and you're, you're, you're doing human sacrifice. Uh, that's, that's, that's it. Um, and there's, um, and I haven't, I've never been to the Holy Land, uh, but uh, just outside of Jerusalem um, is the, the Valley of uh, Hinnom. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, traditionally, uh, that is where in, in Judah, because it also took, it didn't just take place in Israel, up uh, in the northern kingdom, it also took place in, in Judah. And with Judah, that was kind of the, the last straw. Uh, and we're told, I believe it was King Manasseh, um, his, his, uh, his sons, uh, some of his children, he, he sacrificed to the idols. Uh, but uh, in, that, in that place where they, where they did that, uh, that ground, uh, mm -hmm. they realized what a disgusting practice that was. Um, that actually became the city dump. Uh, that's where they threw the garbage because they weren't going to use that land for anything else after that um, because they they just couldn't bear to, to, to see what you know see what it, what had taken place in that in that place. Um, and you know the the and I think he 
makes a, a fairly good parallel uh, to the sacrifice that, that people people make for convenience, for embarrassment, for uh, you know uh, financial reasons, whatever, uh, to say, well, uh, you know, I uh, and you know, without we're just about out. Of, I guess we are a little bit out of time here, but uh, you know, to, to go into into too much too much depth, but to uh, to recognize uh, that that. Uh, when, when it came to human life, uh, God says, I, I created this one. Uh, I create a living soul. Uh, and if, if you're going to destroy that, uh, then, then, uh, then, then we're about done here. Yes. Uh, yes, yes. And, um, and that's, that's one of those, those very sad realities. Um, now, again, there's a lot of things that, that, that we, can, we can do. Uh, Politically, socially, uh, for for those things, uh, but you know as well as I do that um, we can we can uh, work and, and even if we can get the law changed, it's not going to stop us the, the practice. Is it? No. Uh, the only thing that can do that is a changing of the heart, which can only happen through the proclamation of the gospel. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's just a, a, a that much more of an encouragement for us to get that message of, of God's grace and forgiveness in Jesus uh, out to the world so they understand that every life is a life that, that Jesus has died for. Um, and that makes every life precious, whether it's been born or hasn't been born yet. All right, questions? Yeah. Always said with chapter 13, God's made up his mind about what's going to happen to the northern kingdom. Uh, but even while passing his irrevocable judgment, um, he also promises deliverance from, from death and salvation for his people. Okay. Uh, all right, uh, let's close with, with prayer and um, and Sharon. 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 Yeah, Sharon. Uh, and then let's remember Jerry. So we lost Jerry. Ah, yes. Um, yeah. Again, her tells you. Yep. Exactly. Yep. Uh, uh, you're by quick. Yep. So, Lord, we uh, we thank you for this this time in your word. Uh, remind us that each day is a gift of your grace. Remind us of the, the reality and seriousness of our sins, that we never cheapen the love that you have for us and the sacrifice that your son made uh, in our behalf uh, to take on the curse of our sin. Uh, Lord, this evening we ask a special measure of your protecting hand on, on Sharon uh, as she uh, faces cancer. Lord, you, you know the proper treatments for her. You know what she needs. Uh, you also know how to best take care of her. And so, Lord, we simply ask that you would uh, place her in your hands and, and take care of uh, her in the, in the way that you know is best. Uh, watch over them in the, in this, during this time and, and just give them peace and confidence in your promises. Uh, Lord, we place them in your hands. Uh, Lord, we, we thank you for the, the gift of, of Christian brothers uh, and, and sisters in our lives and uh, Lord, uh, uh, you, you've uh, taken one of your saints uh, to yourself, and uh, while we miss Gary, uh, we also uh, wouldn't for a second want him back here in this sinful world, but uh, thank you that uh, 